Hello, everyone. This uh, is a second attempt to to tape to record this uh, uh, the very beginning of uh, Lillian's presentation. We had a, a problem. Well, somehow Google Meet was misbehaving, so so we didn't manage to to capture the very uh, first few minutes of, of her presentation. So so I asked her to. Uh, to do it again now without the audience, everybody was. I mean, the room was was full, but uh, now everybody was dismissed for for lunch, and and Lilia is uh, uh, working a bit extra <laughs> minutes just to make sure that we have the complete uh, presentation for the records. So please, Lilia, go ahead. Thank you. So I'm Lillian, and I'm a professor here at uh, physics department at UFSCA. And I'll, I'll be talking <laughs> in the, this presentation about ceramics materials, which are the ma materials that I work with, and uh, about this technique of producing those ceramics materials, which is called reactive flash sintering. So, Thank you, the audience that it was here before <laughs> for attending this presentation. And also thank you, Professor Homa, who did the invitation and also Professor uh, Ortiz for, for keeping that invitation this semester. So uh, here is the outline of my presentation where uh, I'll give you some introduction on the topic, the basics of ceramics materials, what is a ceramic, uh, why it is important to stu study those materials and how to produce them. I'll talk a little bit about flash sintering as well. Uh, then we will go for methods and react flash sintering of three systems. As an example, uh, as you can see here, the have very complex composition that's why i'm going to abbreviate the names here and finally some conclusions on this subject let's start with the introduction and uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the field you may hear the word ceramic and probably what you are going to think is something like that and you are completely right those are ceramics because ceramic definition is very broad. Uh, it can be defined as any inorganic, non-metallic non solid, like oxides, nitrides, carbides. But in this talk, I want to focus on uh, what we call advanced ceramics, because they are ceramics that have very specific properties, and that's why they are applied in many modern technologies, like electronic devices, uh, most of your computers, uh, cell phones, they are uh, filled with uh, a lot of ceramic materials because uh, these are the base of many capacitors, thermistors, varistors, and uh, also ceramics are um, potential materials for developing new technologies like all solid state lithium batteries. LZO, for instance, one of the materials that I'll be talking a little bit about today is the state-of-the-art uh, material for uh, solid electrolyte in lithium batteries. We may have also uh, materials that uh, can be applied as gas sensors in sulfics. Besides the electronic devices applications, this is the part that I'm mo most interested in, but we may have advanced ceramics in many other applications like um, uh, medical uh, implants, uh, like optical uh, materials, uh, magnetic materials, and so on. Uh, you can imagine, uh, therefore, that this is a billionaire global market, and uh, it attracts a lot of attention, mine <laughs> included, included. So now that you know, why to what is a ceramic material why to study it i want to talk a little bit how to produce those materials so in this slide uh, i'm going to show you the main steps of uh, 
the production of a ceramic material, which involves uh, mainly two big steps, which is synthesis and sintering that we call. And sorry, I heard some, I, I cannot see the, the chat. So if you have any questions, please. No, okay. no, that was me. I started, um, you know, recording at the very beginning, but it, it didn't work. So I kept trying and, and it's working now. So, so oh. we, we missed, uh, for the records, we missed the uh, very beginning of your talk. Sorry oh. about that. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Otis. Anyways, just uh, <laughs> uh, for the matter of recording, now that I motivate why uh, to study ceramic materials, let's talk a little bit on how to produce, how to fabricate those materials. And it involves several steps that we can uh, divide it in two main steps, which I'm going to call synthesis, where we uh, form our desired composition and sintering, which is uh, the step where we give mechanical strength to the solid piece. So that being said, for the synthesis, usually we mixed, for instance, two compositions as in starting materials, uh, A and B here. And we heat this mixture to produce a final composition C because this A and B material will react to form this uh, C material. For instance, in the case of uh, barium titanate, uh, we may have barium oxide and uh, titanium oxide mixed in the uh, stoichiometric ratio for forming barium titanate, for instance. So after uh, having the powder with the composition that you desire to, to study, Usually, we shape the sample by some uh, compactation method, usually applying pressure. And if you have a look at the microscopy of that uh, uh, pressed powder, you would see something like this, which is, you know, uh, some particles that we call uh, not well uh, bonded, a lot of voids, which is porosity, and to get rid of that porosity, usually we do a sintering processing by heating the sample at high temperatures, usually close to the melting point of the material. And uh, what happens is densification and also grain growth, which is the sintering process that we call. And the final sintered ceramic would look like this in the microscopic. So, this is what we want when we are dealing with bulk, bulk ceramic materials, densified samples. So look on how these uh, voids were eliminated here. And in both of these processes, uh, reaction and densification, that we are being focusing in, in this presentation, we have a lot of diffusion of mass. So, as you may recall, diffusion is a thermally activated uh, process. That's why we heat the sample to uh, enha enhance the diffusion processes in both the cases. But even though this is the diffusion coefficient and it follows on a, a, a henius like equation, and even though at high temperature for promoting um, the reaction and also the densification, it requires a lot of time, several hours to complete uh, these processes by using this conventional technique. So uh, each of these steps may, uh, in each of these spe steps, it may be applied a different uh, technique, but I, I'm not going to focus on those steps only on these two, but processing in general is very important for, because um, the processing conditions affect, as you can see here, the microstructure of the ceramics. I put here microstructure because of it can affect also the structure, as you can imagine. And uh, these will be tailoring the properties of the final ceramic. Today, uh, I'll be not able to talk much about the properties of the ceramics that we are going 
uh, to present because of uh, timing issue, but I'll be glad to answer any questions later on. So, uh, as I told you, it's really hard and it requires a lot of time for having that mass transport through our sample during synthesis, during reaction. And especially in the case of sintering, uh, it can be accelerated by many different techniques, which uh, uh, includes flash sintering, which was uh, first reported in 2010 by Professor Raj Group, which uh, where I did my postdoc. That's why I'm going to talk a little bit about this group later on. And it, it is a field assisted sintering technique. It means that not only uses heat, but also use electric field to promote sintering. And for you to have an idea, I'm presenting here how uh, uh, non-conventional sintering techniques may uh, accelerate the process. Like here we have the time of sintering and the temperature. This is furnace temperature. And the conventional is the less efficient one uh, but we can uh, accelerate the sintering rates by applying some pressure and also some electric field, as is the case of flash sintering here. But we have also microwave sintering, spark plasma sintering, and many, many others. And uh, so now that you have an idea what is flash sintering, I'm going to show you a uh, real time experiment flash sintering. Here we have this sample, which has a very peculiar shape, which we call dog bone shaped sample, because it allows us to hang it inside the furnace that we will heat. And with the uh, platinum wires, we can apply the electric field, which will be shown here, and allow the current to flow through the ceramic, which will be shown here. So we have uh, uh, power density being dissipated within the sample that we can see increases a lot at the ignition of the flash event, as we call. So alongside this high power dissipation, we have uh, very rapid sh shrinkage, which means densification. So we can also monitor by the camera the rate of uh, retraction of our sample. So this is a typical flash sintering experiment that uh, I hope uh, you can follow up when I show later on, but I'll be glad to ans answer any questions. Uh, I'll try to uh, avoid much, much specifics because I know it's a broad audience. It is hard sometimes, but uh, I'll, I'll try to be very gen general. So now that we know why to use flash sintering and how uh, an experiment look like. Let's see what is the phenomenology behind this technique. At first, there was a lot of discussion what was going on, why the sample uh, display that behavior of uh, increasing so rapidly the uh, current, not falling on a heinous behavior. But nowadays, there is a consensus and also a lot of predictions uh, of the parameters that the sample will uh, show this behavior, which is based on thermal runaway. What is thermal runaway? It is a positive, positive feedback loop. In a simple way, when you hit your sample, your ceramic material, usually you increase the conductivity. By increasing the conductivity, you allow current to flow, and of course, there is some power uh, dissipation, but usually this, this, this power is released. So the sample uh, behaves linearly. But at some point, if the heat generated by dual heating cannot be dissipated, it creates a positive feedback loop where the dual heating generated uh, increases again the conductivity that generates more dual heating, then increases conductivity, and we have the runaway, which, which is, in other words, a dielectric breakdown of your sample. And if you don't control this breakdown, you are going to 
break your ceramic. That's why we limit the current allowed to flow to flow in our sample. If you don't do that, or if you allow uh, more current than your sample can handle, it will break. And I can tell you this happens a lot uh, during flash centering uh, parameters optimization. So this is a very powerful way of using this energy to promote sintering. And why by doing this uh, fast processing, this sintering is enha enhanced. As I told you before, uh, diffusion processes and sintering itself, they are uh, thermally activated. And uh, if I plot the uh, arrhenius like graph here, where we have the linearization of this arrhenius type equation, we can see uh, a line where the slope is associated with the activation energy of that mechanism of uh, diff diffusion. And in the case of sintering, we may have uh, diffusion by grain growth or densification. The densification is the mechanism that, that we wish for, but you know, at low temperatures, here we have the reciprocal of the temperature, at lower temperatures, the grain growth dominates. That's why rapid sintering techniques, uh, they are, uh, uh, they enhance the sintering, the densification, because they, they don't give time to the system to stay in this region, going to the uh, area where densification is favored. So this is also why rapid sintering techniques usually uh, helps in fabricating fine grain cer ceramics. And this is not related with the field. You, you may have, for instance, fast firing, uh, other uh, uh, sintering techniques, which are rapid, like laser sintering. And this, is, this also applies. But in the case of flash sintering, not only we have the fast processing, the high heating rates, but we may also have some field effects, which is a little bit uh, is still controversial because it is material dependent. For instance, in oxides, you may generate uh, oxygen vacancies that can improve uh, diffusion processes in your ceramic and so on. But uh, recently, not only this uh, thermal runaway has been used to promote sintering, but, but also uh, synthesis of material. So the first part of our processing step can be performed by using this approach. And not only that, we can combine synthesis and sintering in one single step. We can do by applying react flash sintering, which is being called uh, nowadays, uh, promote synthesis and sintering in one single step. And this is what I'll be talking in this presentation, as you may re remember from the title. So for uh, carrying out the flash sintering, react flash sintering experiments, we uh, fabricated the starting powders using, remember, we may have many, many different techniques for each step of ceramic processing. So for uh, having the starting powder, we used a wet chemistry method, which is uh, known as Pekini. But uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, I cannot go into details right now. Uh, and we did react flash sintering experiments, like the one that I showed you in the video. And after uh, we have uh, done many characterizations in our ceramic samples, like XRD, uh, microscopy, elemental map by EDS, impedance spectroscopy to look at the electrical pro properties. Um, but I want to highlight the in-situ in synchrotron XRD that it was performed in the Brookhaven National Lab at the NSLS tubing line. And there they have a setup which allows for uh, react flash sintering. So here in this picture, we can see the furnace here where we can apply the electric field 
we have the uh, XRD and uh, it will be easy to look at the schematics of the sample holder inside the furnace, where we have our sample, which will be React Flash Sinterat, the electrodes where we will apply the field, and we have holes in the furnace uh, that allows the X-ray beam to hit the sample and the diffracted beam uh, travels to hit the detector here. And since we are dealing with high energy X-ray radiation, it is possible to acquire a XRD full pattern every second, more or less. So that was important in the case of react reactive flash sintering because the reactions happens very, very rapidly. So this is how a 2D XRD would look like in the detector. And after doing some integration, we would have the 1D XRD of our ceramics that maybe most of you are more familiar with and I'll be showing during this presentation. So let's start with the React Flash Sintering case of LLTO, as I call here. And for doing that work, I uh, had many collaborations because I did uh, part of this work in Professor Raj group. And there I had the opportunity to meet uh, uh, his former PhD students, Bola Young and Viviana Avila, which you know, they, are, they were PhD students at that time and, and did uh, the hard, hard work as usual. So uh, thank you again, Bola, for coming. And this material, I want to explain a little bit uh, about his, uh, its structure and uh, properties. This is a lithium conductor ionic conductor. So for having higher ionic conductivity, it would be desired to stabilize the cubic phase. But the cubic phase, uh, this is a perovskite that may crystallize in cubic, tetragonal, or tohombic phases. But uh, for stabilizing the cubic phase, cubic phase, which is the high temperature phase at room temperature, usually uh, thermal quenching is done. So in, in that case, the conductivity will be higher. And uh, before showing the React Flash Sintering experiments, I want to have a look what happens when we take our starting powder and we uh, heat it inside the furnace without electric field, which we call conventional heating. So this was the starting powder for this system which is amorph amorphous. This is the XRD, so there is no defined peak, amorphous phase. And this is common because we are doing dealing with a wet chemistry method. But uh, if we hit this powder, it will crystallize and let's have a look in which phases. So at 800 degrees C for two hours, we got this XRD here where we have a composition close to the one that we aim, but also some intermediates here. So in order to uh, react these intermediates and diffuse it into the matrix, we need to give more energy uh, to that diffusion process. And by doing so at almost 1200 degrees C, we observed the final phase that we aimed, like uh, here we have the cubic LLTO, but also we saw some um, tetragonal reflections, which are indicated by the arrow. Anyways, irrespective of that, what we uh, see here is that by heating this starting powder in this system conventionally, the formation of LLTO happens in a multi-stage process. We have some intermediates that react to form the final phase. So from here to here, it is similar to solid state reaction. And uh, this was also observed by different groups using different synthesis techniques. It's all, it is always a multi-stage um, synthesis process. 
now that we know how the system behaves by conventional heating, let's have a look what happens when we react flash that sample. So first of all, I'm going to present the uh, electrical uh, power of the sample power density here in an arrhenius like graph. And uh, I, as I hope you remember from the video, uh, we expect a sudden increase in power dissipation in the flash event. So the flash event happens in this region where I highlight in the graph and before that uh, the sample behaves uh, very linearly, pretty much linearly. Uh, so this characterize the ignition of the flash event here. We have applied different fields which uh, trigger the flash in different furnaces temperature. It, this is very common in flash literature. So, but not only we monitor the power in our sample during uh, the flash experiments, but we also had a look at the strain which is related with the densification of the ceramics. And uh, besides the flash samples here, we also uh, have kind of dilatometry of the uh, zero field sample because we want to check what is the densification without the electric field. And we saw that even go to close to 1200 degrees C, like uh, I showed, I showed you in the previous slide that we got the final composition, but we didn't get much densification if you compare with the one that was flash process. So this was uh, confirmed by doing microscopy where we can see that uh, the sample conventionally heated uh, didn't have time to complete sintering. So we have a highly uh, porous sample which for applications doesn't work, the ones that we are willing for. So for this, in this case, it would be needed as usual in conventional processing to uh, grind this powder compact again and promote sintering in a different step. But in the case of react, react flat sintering, what we see is that from here to here, we have a lot of densification in each case. So uh, as an example, we can see here that the final ceramic is, is extremely dense. It was higher than 98% of the theoretical density. And uh, also in here, and we can also see that uh, the microstructure may depend on the field, but as I told you today, we are going to focus on the processing. So. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the microstructure now. We know from this slide that, okay, conventionally heating the sample transforms to the final phase, but you don't have densification. And react flash sintering the sample, you have densification. And now we need to see if we have the final phase that we aim. So that's what I'm going to talk on this slide because we collect the XRD of the um, react flash sintering, during react flash sintering. And uh, in this video, you can see the patterns every second while heating the sample and applying the field. In the beginning, the power uh, increases in a regular rate but at some point we will trigger the flash event. And what happens is that when the flash event happens, the crystallization also takes place. To be uh, more clear, I can show you here again, the flash curves of our experiments where I extract in four instances, the XRD. So because in the video you saw there were at least 1,200 uh, patterns, so <laughs> it, I'm going to show this for is enough for our conclusions. The starting powder again 
which we know is amorphous. So at point one, two, and three, not much happen, as you can see. But for from point three to point four, we have a lot of crystallization. And as we saw in the microstructure, from point three to point four, we also have a lot of densification. So you can imagine the massive mass transport that it is happening in the sample for, from this point to this point. Synthesis and densification from here to here all together. This is what we call react flash sintering. But now I want to focus a little bit on the crystallization pathway because as you remember, this is expected to be a multi-stage uh, synthesis process. So intermediates are formed and then you get the final composition. But in the case of react flash sintering, surprisingly, we uh, avoided the intermediates and we went to the final cubic LL0 phase. Um, this, in, in this case, great, we avoided the intermediates, but in the next example, I'm going to show you that this is not always the case during react flash sintering. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the second system. So this is the LL0. I, Again, <laughs> Bola and Viviana from Professor Raj Group, and again, a lithium conductor. This is the state of the art lithium conductor for solid state uh, batteries. And Viviana liked so much working with lithium conductors that now she's working at a battery company. So <laughs> uh, this is it's very nice. And uh, Let's talk a little bit about this composition be before going through the results again. This uh, also may crystallize in cubic or tetragonal compositions. This is a garnet structure. And in the cubic form has the higher, higher conductivity. That's why we use aluminum doping to stabilize the cubic phase at room temperature. So. Let's have a look at the starting powder. In this case, it was crystalline, but it has many phases. It has the uh, final phase here, but it was mainly constituted of these intermediates, LZO, and also this is another one more complex here. And again, we did react flash sintering on this system. In this case, it was very interesting that while we were uh, optimizing the parameters, because of course we don't have the synchrotron uh, XRD daily in the lab, so before going there, we do some parameters optimization. And while doing so, we had such a trouble on having a single phase ceramic by react flash sintering this sample that it was very boring at first. And uh, at the beginning, we thought, oh, this is a bad result. But in science, we know there is no such a thing as bad result. And <laughs> this ended up being the most interesting result, as I'm going to show in the next slide, slides. But what happens is that we tried many, many electrical parameters. And always this intermediate would be there most of the time. It was really hard to get rid of, of it. And, uh, but we could find a condition which was uh, uh, the same as this one, but increasing a little bit the holding time of the current for 30 seconds, for instance, from 20 to 30. And in this case, we have uh, the single phase LZO as we wished. Uh, just a, a parenthesis here, why we were so upset. You may think, oh, this is a little bit uh, this is synchrotron XRD, high resolution, so this is a little bit of secondary phases. Why? That's fine. But in this particular case, sometimes this is fine. But in this particular case, uh, this uh, secondary phase hinders a lot the lithium conductivity. 
So we did some uh, impedance spectroscopy in this sample and also in this sample, and the conductivity of this was extremely lower than this one. That being said, let's focus now on what happens, because here we have the starting powder and the XRD of the starting powder and of the final ceramic. From here to here, what happens? For uh, knowing that, we need to look at the in-situ XRD measurements. And at this time, since it was very intriguing, the results, we needed to perform also the conventional in-situ measurements uh, of the, the sample. So we did in-situ measurements during conventional heating and during react flash sintering uh, processing. And of course, in the conventional heating, uh, we could take uh, patterns at uh, a lower speed because it, the uh, processing was longer. So these are the results. Here we have, again, XRD patterns, but I'm showing you in the third axis the temperature of the sample, which was measured at this time with a thermo, a pyrometer, sorry, uh, focused on the surface of the ceramic. Uh, we have here many, many XRD patterns, but we can pay attention to this region here, close to 3.5 degrees, where there is a huge difference between the conventional heating and the react flash sintering. So let's have a closer look at this region. So I'll zoom up and select some patterns so we can see here what happens during conventional and react flash sintering. So during conventional heating, the uh, intermediate LZO phase would uh, slowly dissolves into the matrix as is expected. This is the gui guideline for the peak of the LZO phase. But in the case of react flash sintering, instead of dissolving in the matrix, this secondary or intermediate phase would increase and take over the sample until the very end of the experiment. At some point, this effect was overcome by the temperature uh, achieved by the sample and it collapsed in the final phase L L0. So this happens here very rapidly from this pattern to this pattern. It's the very end, if you look here, of the experiment. So if we take one pattern every second, this happens in a matter of seconds. So um, I want to make uh, some points with this uh, results. First of all, this explains why we had such a hard time for having single phase LZO using React Flash Sintering because it enhanced the phase that we didn't want at that time. That's why, depending on the, on the parameters, we would stop somewhere here in this region. But this bad result, it can be looked uh, at a different way. Wait, again, the processing is changing the reaction pathway during react flash sintering. Now, it is not uh, I've avoiding the formation of intermediates, but it is enhancing that formation. Anyways, applying electric fields may change the crystallization pathway when compared to conventional heating. But why is that? I'm going to give you some hints on the phenomenology of uh, react flash sintering. Again, like in flash sintering itself, we have high heating rates. So for sure that plays a role. And we call it thermal effects, the high temperature that the sample reach alongside the high heating rate. And we have, uh, luckily, a uh, very recent work on something similar. But in that case, what they do is they sandwich a ceramic, uh, like we do, that is not reacted yet, and they perform synthesis and sintering in one experiment, but only with heat, because 
here we have the uh, carbon tapes where the sample is sandwiched within. And in this case, what is heated by the field is the carbon tape. And the sample is heated through conduction of heat. In that case, they show that it is also possible to react and sinter the sample in one single step. That being said, uh, thermal effects, of course, play an important role in react flash sintering, but we don't have any results yet on what is the uh, crystallization pathway in that case. Is it the same, how it changes with this rapid sintering technique? So we need more information on that. And the second type of effect that we may expect is electric field uh, associated, like in the flash sintering. In the case of crystallization, uh, we can think of nucleation of uh, a new phase and growth of that phase. And uh, it is a different system, but we can look at this paper where they have induced crystallization of a glass system, which is amorphous, by applying some electric field, um, not in that extreme extreme temperatures like we have here, so it was easier to separate what is field effect from what is thermal effect. But anyways, they showed that uh, the free energy of formation of the nucleus of the, the nucleus of critical size of the new phase that you are induced will be affected by the magnitude of the electric field, but also on the dielectric constant of the new medium the final medium, which has the induced uh, nuclei and the initial medium without those nuclei. So if the final phase has higher dielectric constant, the electric field will uh, enhance the formation of this, that phase. However, if the new medium has lower dielectric constant, the electric field will hinder that phase formation, that nucleation of uh, that nuclei of critical size. This is now where we are at uh, React Flash Sintering. We need uh, uh, to run experiments trying to separate what are the thermal effects, what are the electric field effects, and maybe this is some homework for who are from the field, who knows. But to, to finish uh, this presentation, I, I think it is uh, interesting to talk a little bit about this last system. Look how we increase the composition. <laughs> we got more complex here. And this is what we call high entropy oxide. And this is uh, a re recent work that uh, Bola and Bibi again <laughs> participated. And uh, as I told you what Bibi is doing right now, I want to share that Bola liked so much the synchrotron experiments that she's working now at a national lab in Oak Ridge. So let's see uh, what expect from React Flash Centering of this composition. We call this entro high entropy oxide because this is a uh, rock salt structure which have one uh, cation site and one anion site. But in the cation site, we put uh, several cations. So this is for increasing the entropy of configuration. And we do that because uh, here we have the molar fraction of the uh, cation and the, this entropy is maximized by using this equimolar composition. That's why we use so. And it, it has been shown recently that by doing that, increasing the entropy of the material, it is possible to stabilize, to stabilize a solid solution, which is not predicted by uh, the um, phase diagrams of the single oxides. Uh, by increasing in the free energy, this term here associated, associated, associated with the <laughs> entropy. Of course, for 
this term to dominate the free energy, we need to go high temperature. And this uh, entropy considerates uh, random distribution of the cations over the site. So we need to give the system also some time to that happens. And when this term overcomes this term in the free energy, we have what we call entropy stabilization of the solid solution. And we uh, can do some tests to evaluate if our sample is stabilized by entropy or entropy. For instance, if uh, it is stabilized by entropy, we expect that at lower temperature, this term will overcome this one and phase separation will happen at moderate temperatures. So you can perform some reversible phase transformation upon, upon cycling the sample. It is also an endothermic reaction. You can check that and uh, you expect when entropy takes place that the cations are randomly distributed, as I told you before, so we can check the homogeneity of our sample. So <clears throat> in this part, I want to show you that we optimize the flash parameters for react flash sintering of this composition. And the starting powder was uh, uh, has a lot of phases, as you can see here. The rock salt is already there because uh, some of the oxides crystallize in rock salt structure. But uh, as I told you from the phase diagram, not all of them is favored in the rock salt. So for instance, the zinc oxide crystallized in the vertzite uh, type of structure, the copper oxide crystallized in the tenorite type of structure. So we have that messy, many, many phases material that uh, by what I showed you before, it is expected if we hit the sample at uh, enough temperature and we are able to overcome the entropy of formation of these phases, we will get we will have the uh, solid solution of the rock salt structure. So we tried many parameters and we ended up finding some conditions during react flash sintering that we got the single phase rock salt. Uh, structure and uh, it is an indication that we have the stabilization by entropy of our system. But to be uh, sure that we got entropy stabilized oxide, we can check uh, those points that I told you is the sample homogeneous, is the uh, stabilization of the phase reversible, was the uh, crystallization reaction endothermic. For doing that, we first checked the homogeneity and we did elemental mapping of the sample after react flash sintering. And here each color represents one cation, as you can see, and we saw random distribution of the cations over our sample, indicating that it was homogeneous. But that's not enough. Let's have a look. Is this phase formation stabilization reversible? So if we hit that sample at lower temperature to make that entropy term overcome the entropy part in the free energy again, uh, there is phase se separation driven by entropy. So we uh, post annealed this sample, this same sample, and we did XRT to have a look. Again, the flash sintered sample was single rock salt phase, but after post annealing at lower temperature, which was 700 degrees in this case, we could separate the copper oxide phase here, the tenorite, as we can see in the XRD. So this is the uh, synchrotron XRD, so that's why the angles are low. But to be sure, to further confirm this information, we uh, did the elemental mapping of this post annealed sample, which I'm going to show here. And now we could see some clusters 
of copper, which agrees with the tenorite phase that we just observed in the XRD. And also we can see some lacking of copper in the mapping of the other cations. So now we prove that the phase was stabilized but could be separated at lower temperature. Finally, we also checked the endothermicity of our reaction, but for doing that, we have used in situ, in situ XRD and it would take uh, uh, more time than I expect to explain, but uh, I hope you believe me, it was also endothermic reaction and that's why we could stabilize this oxide by entropy using react flash sintering. Uh, after that work, uh, we saw many, many different materials being fabricated by this technique. Uh, high, uh, many high entropy materials, I mean carbides, nitrides, and so on, which is very exciting news. So I think we had enough of react fast sintering. <laughs> I'm going to give you some take home message right now that this technique is very convenient. It is a rapid, so it's cost effective. You can have a lot of mass diffusion throughout your ceramic, not only for synthesis, for sintering as well in a very short time, but also we can change the crystallization pathway using this technique. So in our case, we favored some intermediate that was it was not our aim, but we can tailor that technique to producing some match stable phases that are not favored upon conventional heating. Finally, uh, we need to keep studying what is going on during react flash sintering to separate what is field effect, what is thermal effect. So I want to thank you everyone for uh, the attention, also my collaborators uh, that helped me a lot and I'll be open to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you Lillian for the nice presentation. <clears throat> so we have time uh, for questions or uh, comments. I hope you could under understand me because <laughs> I was not sure the microphone. No, it was all the... clear. Okay, thank you. Good question, yes. Uh, so let me uh, let me open it again. Is there anyone willing to show your face or? Uh, allow us to to hear your voice no comments no questions uh, we have some uh typing so Juan Vitor Campos says thank you Lilian amazing talk Bola said uh, thank you Lilian it was a very great talk Isabella thank you guys <laughs> Great presentation, Lilian. Thank you. And Viviana, great presentation. Thank you, Lilian. Oh, Viviana is here. Thank you, Viviana, for coming. <laughs> Thank you for so the we have, uh, yeah, we have congratulations, but no questions. I but they know question. they know more than me. Oh, okay. Who? who? Okay. Michael. <laughs> oh, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, it's not. Uh, Big question, okay? I would like to okay. know if uh, do you do you know if someone used this technique to 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 prepare YBCO, the superconducting ceramic YBCO family? Uh, you know I'm not sure. I don't think I've seen any paper because uh, it is a very recent uh, technique, as you can see. Mm -hmm. Actually, I started doing my PhD doing that, but it took me a lot of time to publish. So nowadays it's been more uh, common to see uh, this type of uh, experiments in the literature. Uh, 
But I, I don't recall any, any of that composition. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm, yeah. I, I'm mm -hmm. seeing a lot of uh, like ionic conductors, semiconductors, and high entropy materials, a lot mm -hmm. of them. Yeah, especially in this technique. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to know because there are some families that is not the common ones, that is one, two, three, YBCO one, two, three. There mm -hmm. is another one that's 358, which is much more complex. Uh, and uh, I think that people is not uh, doing too much in this direction. And maybe this technique is easier to get this, to reach this, this uh, let's say, no usual uh, phase. But OK. That's what, what I hope so. Yeah. Because for instance, in this work here, they have shown that they stabilize a non-usual uh, phase as well. So uh, this is the future direction, I think, of this type of work, is trying to use this technique for stabilizing phases that are not easy to get by conventional method. I see. So Thank it you. is worth trying. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I have one question, comment. Uh, would you be... Uh, able to comment on, on what would be um, uh, the uh, uh, differences between using this technique for films and bulk materials? Oh, great question. Because there are some research on uh, films produced by React Flash Sintering, like Flash Sintering in general. But the problem is that you have the substrate. So it is hard to control the current flow depending on the conductivity of the substrate of the sample. So you need to direct for using that thermal energy uh, of dual heating the current through the sample or using conduction. So depending on the, the combination of substrate, it may be hard and also uh, the, the manner that you are going to apply the electric field because here we hang with the electrodes but using you, you need to have some substrate that may be uh, with some electrodes by lithography or something like that but i'm not into doing films yet but i know there are people doing that so it's in principle it's feasible but uh, you you might have to learn how to control or how to yeah yeah make room for the uh, path for the current right yeah yeah, yeah. but yeah. feasible it is <laughs> there are people doing that I, I think. yeah well uh ariano just raised his hand okay thank you uh, thank you Lina, for our presentation uh just on uh, uh, small question about the structural conditions in this uh, system. How, how big is how big is the sample we can do with, with this technique? Uh, oh. I mean, uh, if, if, if it is if it's really big, I mean, if it, if it's big um, uh, uh, um, centimeters or, or I don't know, a couple of centimeters wide, uh, mm -hmm. do you expect to see some different in difference in composition along the red radial direction? Okay, this is a really good question, <laughs> actually. Uh, that we use this uh, shape is, is not uh, without purpose, is because in this way we can have a very homogeneous electric field here and the uh, homogeneity of the sample will be very good at the uh, cross section here. Uh, we can see differences close to the electrodes, but usually cut the sample here. But uh, I can talk a little bit about, actually we have an expert on how the geometry of the sample uh, affects the homogeneity of the sample. There are some uh, flash experiments that are performed in pellets, which is the more usual uh, shape of ceramic materials. So by using pellets, you may have some uh, current localization more often than using dog bond shape sample. And of course, if you have current localization, this is going to influence the heat and also the homogeneity of the sample. But what we do is that we optimize 
our flash parameters for having the more homogeneous sample before uh, going deeper into investigation. So for the samples that we are investigating, usually we have very homogeneous sample. I cannot guarantee, for instance, close to the electrodes, but in this region, we can do microstructural characterizations and see that uh, they are very homogeneous. But there are many, many issues related to uh, homogeneity. In the case of the phase transformation, I cannot tell you over the whole section because, oh, answering your question is 1.5 centimeter long, uh, three, as I remember, millimeter uh, the width, and the thickness is to one or two millimeters, more or less, in this case. But uh, in the case of uh, the XRD experiments, we are dealing with transmission mold. So throughout the thickness of the sample, that is the average result. But we also did the ex situ XRD in most of the cases where we cut the sample and we uh, use powder method, for instance, and we saw that the phase was, of course, it can be done XRD on several parts of the ceramic to check, but since it is uh, early, we just started studying those type of experiments, we uh, don't have that information yet. But in the case of the, uh, for instance, the synchrotron XRD, we didn't do only one sample. So sometimes we would focus on here or here, the X-ray beam to see and the behavior was reproducible. So I would expect that at least in this shape that we are using the phase transformation is homogeneous throughout the sample. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question.